Hey everyone. The other day I ran into a little bit of a corner case during one of my training sessions for Rust, and uh, I thought I would put together a little video plus a blog post to explain what was going on with this. So let's start off with this bit of code that's sitting in front of us. We've got this function uses string. We move a string into that function, and then in main, we create a name, which is going to be a string, and then we call use a string twice on that. Now this doesn't work. And the reason is because it's a use of, of a move value, name. The most direct way to solve this problem is right up here to call name.core. And that solves the problem right away. But we're going to pretend for just a moment that we don't have any such thing as method syntax. So instead of calling .clone, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go ahead and call this using the clone class directly. We're going to do clone, colon, clone, clone, and we're going to pass in a name and then call name clone here. This also doesn't work. The reason is because of mismatched types. Expected reference, but found a struct std string string. That makes perfect sense. If you look at the definition of the clone method, it takes a reference to self instead of just taking self. Therefore, this doesn't work. The types don't line up. The reason for this is that Rust doesn't automatically insert a borrow for us for various reasons. We're not going to get into to design. All right, that's fine. So now let's say we wanted to switch over to method syntax. The most direct thing you may think, at least I may think, is I've got a borrow name and then call dot clone. And that seems to make sense, except that's horrible ergonomics. Having to put in the parentheses and the borrow each time isn't particularly pleasant. And therefore, part of the language is when you've got a situation like this, you can leave off the borrow. How exactly does this work? Well, there is a feature in the language where it will automatically perform some kind of callback, and it will go ahead and first check if the method works on the value itself, and then it will try doing a borrow and see if it works on a reference of it. So in our case, it first tries out string, finds out, nope, that doesn't work with string. So instead, it's going to go ahead and try borrowing. For the most part, this method call expression fallback mechanism works exactly the way you would expect. But let's hit one of these corner cases, and we're going to trigger a very bad error message. We're going to write something called clone loudly. And it's going to work initially on a reference to string, exactly like we have right now. And it's going to go ahead and print ln that it's cloning. And then it's going to call dot clone. OK, no problem. Everything seems to work just fine. Now down here, instead of doing it the way that I was previous, I'm going to call clone loudly. And again, I have to do the borrow. No surprise there. But now looking at this function, clone loudly, I begin to notice, wait a second. That thing can be generalized. I'm not doing anything particular about a string here. Let's go ahead and stick in the type parameter. T, T, T. Hmm. Well, we're getting an error message. First one makes, this makes perfect sense. Doesn't implement display. OK, that makes sense. I haven't stated the trait bound that T implements display. That's cool. Now I get a completely different error message. Mismatch types. Expected type parameter t, found a reference to t. The really bad part about this is that the real error message it should be giving us is that we need to specify clone. And that makes sense. This line, line 6, is using the display trait. Line 7 is using clone. Why is it that we got a completely different error message in this case? Instead, we were told that we were giving back a reference to t instead of a t. This comes down to that automatic borrowing that I, mess, me, that I mentioned as being part of method call syntax. When you have a method call expression like this, what is it, what's going to happen is we're going to look at the x. We see that x is of type t, sorry, reference to t, and we're going to check, is there any way to call the clone method on a reference to t? We're going to check, see nothing because we haven't stated a trait bound that clone is available. Then borrowing is going to kick in. 
when borrowing kicks in, then we're going to find out, wait a second, you can actually pass in a reference to a reference of t because there is a clone implementation for references. And a reference to a reference is a valid input to clone regardless of what the type is, even if the type doesn't implement clone itself. So we end up borrowing x, getting a reference to a reference of t. And when you clone that, you get back a reference to t. So this function is now expecting to return reference to t. If I put that in, now we have mismatch types down in, on line 13, completely expected. The point of all of this is if you don't pay attention to this weird interaction between the automatic borrowing and the, and the uh, yeah, if you don't pay attention to the automatic borrowing and the fact that you end up getting these references where you don't expect them, you can end up in a situation where at the very least, you get a very confusing error message. I've never seen this turn into a runtime semantic bug myself, but it's certainly possible to come up with a case where something like that could happen. Anyway, hope this was helpful. Have a good day. Bye.